Python, the official language of brilliant academics and people who can't read. I bash Python a lot on this channel, and for good reason. But today, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to sit down, look at the data, and answer the question, how good was Python actually? Released in 1991 by Guido Van Rossum, Python was designed to be simple, easy to read, and aesthetically pleasing. It's the ideological equivalent of that one kid that buys every Apple product. Not for the technology, but because it looks good next to his Hobonichi notebook and meticulously dusted mechanical keyboard. Compared to languages like Java, Python had no brackets because brackets are not aesthetic. No ampersands or exclamation points because punctuation is not aesthetic. And finally, even though static typing is super useful for safety and documentation, Python chose not to have types because, of course, types are not aesthetic. More than just visuals, Python tried to encourage software that looks and feels simple. This means staying away from dark arts and ancient rituals, but also promoting consistency through its language-defining mantra, there's only one way to do it. Where other languages fought over style conventions, like where to put braces, Python forced you to use a certain format by making it part of the syntax of the language. Where other languages had job-specific tools, like arrays, arraylists, and more, Python had one list type that it used for absolutely everything. Again, abysmal performance, but for the people adding three numbers on their M2 MacBook Pro, it doesn't really matter. At this point, I'd like to put Python into the context of the broader ecosystem. You had languages like C and Java, serious languages for serious business, and languages like Bash and Perl for quick scripting. While C and Python were too clunky for quick little tasks, languages like Bash and Perl were the absolute wild west. Many languages let you do whatever you want, but in Perl, developers took that as a challenge. I mean, truly, just because you can put an entire program in a single line of code doesn't mean you should. And this is where Python really shined. It was reckless and nimble enough for quick little tasks, but its relentless focus on readability and consistency meant that once you wrote your quick little script, it could be read by more than one person. It also had all of the common tools from object-oriented languages, so that when temporary scripts grew into large-scale applications, Python could handle the complexity. This brings us to another one of Python's key philosophies, batteries included. Unlike installing Linux drivers, a test of strength for would-be engineers, Python libraries were well-documented and designed to work right out of the box. Of course, every developer aspires to have a project that's well-documented and works right. But most of the time, when the project gets finished and nobody follows up. This is because the kernel maintainers love thinking about file trees and compilers, but not how to make things work with NVIDIA. In the spirit of OCD and having neat corners, Python's libraries were meticulously documented and standardized. In particular, the Python standard library came fully loaded with a standard implementation of everything you wanted to do, and most importantly, it was simple. If you wanted to do something normal, you could just import and go. A good standard implementation also meant that it was less work researching the right tool for the job, and it was easier to read someone else's code because most likely they used the same tools that you did. Now, there are a ton of other fantastic libraries in the Python ecosystem, but today I'd like to focus in on two in particular, NumPy and sklearn. You see, the other tools in this domain were absolutely terrible. Basically, some people saw a group of academics working tirelessly to make the world a better place and thought to themselves, hey, I can make money off that. They created confusing programming languages with conventions that nobody understands, and then convinced the academic community to use it by writing a large standard library of data science tools and niche mathematical algorithms. Once the universities were hooked, they got professors to publish their research in MATLAB. So if you wanted to see the work funded by tuition and your tax dollars, <laughs> you had to pay MathWorks $2,000. Now, you might be thinking to yourself that professors are too smart to fall for this, but remember that they still use academic journals and are more gullible than the people who can't read. People tried to make open source replacements, but they were all pretty awful. They were all these weird languages that were just super clunky, and people just wanted a normal programming language that was super simple and just worked. Remember that these people are not programmers. They're economists, physicists, and social science professors. They don't want to know how to code, they just want to run linear regression and look at the p-value, and then repeat it with slightly different inputs until the number is less than 0 0.05. Because Python was designed to be beginner-friendly, it was approachable to this group of reluctant engineers. What's more, Python's status as a nimble, interpreted language lent itself well to repeated commands and interactive discovery. It took time for the language to catch on within the academic community, but once it did, there was no stopping it. 
Big tech companies now also featured Python for its academically relevant work. <laughs> What's really neat here is it was actually Python's focus on beginner friendliness and approachability that made it the launching ground for some of the world's most advanced tools. <laughs> Next up, I'd like to talk about the elephant in the room, performance. There's no doubt about it. Performance in Python was bad. Most people attribute its terrible performance to its interpreted execution and lack of types, <laughs> both real slowdowns. But notably, it performs significantly worse than other languages with the same properties. I dug around a little, and it seems like the main culprits are lack of just-in-time compilation and the global interpreter lock. I won't go too deep down this rabbit hole, but some languages do an extra compilation step at runtime, just in time, before your code is executed to translate key parts of your program from bytecode into native machine code so that it can run directly as instructions to the CPU. Python, for whatever reason, just like doesn't do this, and it's way slower as a result. There have been a million attempts to add this to Python, PyPy, Numba, Jython, and PyJohn, but they're still not all the way there yet and lacking in mainstream adoption. Hopefully one day some brave programmer will implement a widely adopted and efficient implementation of the Python spec, but we're not quite there yet. In the meantime, serious programmers have implemented a different strategy, not using Python at all. All right, let me explain that. You see, most projects consist of two components, the parts that you run over and over again, and the glue that holds it all together. Certain operations, like matrix multiplication, backpropagation, and graphics rendering, tend to eat up most of the processing power needed to run a program on a machine. But other operations, like setting up a neural net, viewing the data, and interpreting the output, are the engineering tasks that consume most of the time of the programmer. The main idea behind Python development is to pick out the operations that need to be super fast, hardcore optimize them in a language like C++, and then use Python as the glue that holds them all together. This works especially well with Python's large library ecosystem. If you're using a popular library like TensorFlow, the chances are high that you don't even need to do this kind of optimization. You just import the library and it's doing the right thing under the hood. Python has some incredible tools here, and I'd especially like to call out NumPy, Python's tool for fast array and matrix processing. What's really neat here is that NumPy provides very efficient implementations for the fundamental vector and matrix operations. So if you want to write more complex programs, like linear regression, you can do so by composing the fundamental operations, and the resulting program is extremely fast. NumPy does also have library functions for linear regression. This is just an example. While this strategy works most of the time, it doesn't always work. A common example is a web server that responds to thousands of requests per second. For many of these servers, the bulk of the program's logic is run repeatedly, and so there's no way to separate the design complexity from the parts of the program that need to run really fast. What's so frustrating here is Python is a very slow language, but it didn't have to be. It'll never be as quick as C, but it could be much faster, while still keeping the ease of use features that made it so special. Last up, I'd like to talk about Python as just like a normal ass programming language for normal industry applications. Python has everything you'd expect from a full featured modern language, like interfaces, objects and polymorphism, good testing infrastructure, and tools for organizing and documenting large projects. Since it's missing static types, refactoring can be a little bit tricky, but overall the editors and tooling are absolutely fantastic. Everything you would expect from the most popular language in the world. It's got a few uncommon features like multiple inheritance and function decorators, and also the way it handles private variables. But for the most part, it's a pretty normal programming language. If you have a task to do, you could think, eh, I'll do it in Python, and it'd probably be fine. It's good enough to handle some of the world's largest and most complex applications, and it's even one of the few core languages used at Google. As a normal programming language for normal projects, what sets Python apart again is its approachability and ease of scripting. We've already seen how small projects can turn large, but even within massive undertakings, rapid prototyping and library support makes iterating on new ideas much faster. So, how good was Python actually? I'd put Python solidly in B tier. As a language itself, it was mediocre at best. It's unnecessarily slow, and mathematically, it doesn't have any features that make you go wow and really set it apart from its peers. But the Python community is absolutely incredible, and its relentless focus on approachability, usability, and neatness is something we should all learn from. When we write software, what matters most is the experience of using it. And in that sense, Python truly took over the world. Thanks so much for watching. Obviously, if you like this video, give it a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one.